Why would a mega structural complex be the burial site for bulls? Why massive precisely cut sarcophagus that are absolutely stunning and that we cannot replicate in this day and age? If we were to attempt a site like this today, we would be looking at billions, tunneling, architecture, planning, human imagination that is off the charts and did we mention it that engineers and researchers suggest it would be almost impossible because of the location? There is very little doubt that archaeologists are mistaken in their belief that this magnificent complex was built as a burial site for sacred bulls. Would it surprise you guys to learn that of the 24 sarcophagus found at the Serapium of Saqqara, the only one found with animal remains inside was the same one with crude, almost graffiti-type hieroglyphics on the side, a direct confliction of the sheer advanced workmanship involved in the undertaking we see at this mysterious ancient place. Wait till you hear this. Ancient historians' accounts like Herodotus, all these old, old chronicles speak of a former glory age of Egypt known as the Golden Age which some have suggested dates back as far as 10,500 BC. So is it possible that what we have right here may be a remnant of that time? Is it possible that not only was the Serapium built more than 10,000 years ago, back to the time when the Great Pyramid was constructed, but that it was likely built to house the remains but of giant beings in which were considered the gods? Could it be that the Serapium of Saqqara was originally built as a repository for extraterrestrial remains. But if so, what happened to them? How could they have simply vanished without a trace? In the shadow of Egypt's majestic pyramids and monuments and beneath the ever-shifting sands lies the tombs and resting places of more than one million human mummies. The bodies, often thousands of years old, are also well preserved that most are still covered in flesh. But why were the Egyptians mummifying people and going through these elaborate mummification rituals? It would seem that they did want to preserve the body as best they could, but why? The ancient Egyptians went to great lengths to keep the bodies of their dead from decomposing. All organs, except for the heart, were extracted. The brain was pulled out through the nose, all moisture was removed from the body, and hundreds of yards of linen were used to wrap the deceased, all in preparation for what the Egyptians believed to be the afterlife. They were mummified in order to live on in the afterlife, and the afterlife with all the religious symbology that exists in ancient Egypt always had something to do with the stars. Now, if you look at the future, one way of reaching another planet would be if we put ourselves into a state of suspended animation. And we would do this by being inside pods sleeping like this. Ancient Egyptians witnessed something like this, putting on the suit, getting inside their sarcophagus, which looks like a pod, or the pod looks like a sarcophagus. So it's not symbolic at all, but in fact, they witnessed something and misinterpreted it as a spiritual event. The origin of it may have been rooted in misunderstood technology. This raises an interesting point that only mummies of the new kingdom had been found and no one in the old kingdom. So where have they gone? Could it be that with the process of mummification, the ancient Egyptians were trying to recreate a process that had been used in Egypt thousands of years earlier at a time when the land was inhabited by an advanced civilization? What do you guys think of this anyway? Comments below, and as always, thank you for watching. You can see here one of the boxes in the Serapium, rough, with the rough surface. If we follow the Egyptological way of polishing this one, then we will be having few men with sand and rocks polishing the surface. If this works anyway, there's still no space for these men to work. So when we see the other ones also inside the chambers that's finished, hmm? mm -hmm. how would this be finished if you don't have space for the people to be working around? Basic and simple question. So 
here Yosef is one where the lid has been slid back. Yeah. And again, it's believed that the boxes themselves weigh how much? 70 tons for the box and 30 tons for the lid. So the total of 100 tons for the box and the lid in the range. Of and this is not local stone? No, this is not local stone. Where was it brought from, do you think? Not closer than Aswan, which is 1,000 kilometers from here. Well, as you've heard Yusuf say, the box and the lid, of which there are more than 20 of them, each one in its recess, weighs about 100 tons. The stone is from at least a thousand kilometers away and yet the official statement is that these were made during dynastic times late period. the late period yes. as burials for sacred bulls the Apis bull however the level of tolerance and engineering and finish in this incredibly hard stone which the dynastic Egyptians did not have the tools to shape it, tells us that we're looking at an older construction than what Egyptologists say from probably several thousand years ago. And the only way that these boxes were quarried, moved, and put into place underground here and finished would have been using forms of technology that not only the ancient dynastic Egyptians did not have, but that we also do not have to this day because engineer Chris Dunn, author of books such as the Giza Power Plant, asked a firm in the United States if they could replicate one of these out of one piece. And they said, no, we require four pieces for the sides, one piece for the bottom, another piece of the lid. So with 21st century technology, even with an unlimited budget, we cannot achieve this today. We don't talk about much. Uh -huh. We see this, the tunnel itself, is right. all carved in the bedrock. Right. So imagine if we turned off this light now, we're not going to be even able to see our palms right ahead of us. Right. So imagine that you are actually doing this, the challenge of this work, in the dark, how you gonna, what you're going to be using? A flame? There is no even markings of any of this in the dark. There, and there are no openings in the ceiling. Again, if you're doing this work in the open, uh -huh. it was going to be much more, less challenging, dragging, if we're going to be dragging these megalithic boxes, at least the box without the lid is 50 tons. And you need around 2,000 men to drag this. 50 tons, okay? And if we looked at the width of the tunnel, uh -huh. it's maximum two feet wider than the width of the box. Like the one we see here. Hmm? Yeah. And we already measured that before. So there is actually no space for even 500 people or uh, 200 people to be there and doing the dragging part. And also lowering the box down exactly, into the exactly. That it's housed in lower level, that's another challenge. Right. Because now you have to turn with it and then take it in a lower level. And you can see it's almost perfect, the space from all sides. Hmm? Yeah. And there used to be other devices, I believe, in this place, which we can see that they were, there, was, there, there is a carving in the wall to house something else. I believe it could be a false door, or what we know as the false door, which is another device that can possibly regulate frequency and sound, or create standing waves, and controlling also the wavelength of, frequent, of sound frequency. Mm -hmm. So, the only reason again and again that we date and relate and identify these boxes is according to the writings on it. Mm -hmm. And here in this case, we find maximum three boxes with writings on them and more than 20 ones plain without writings. Right. And the one that the officials believe it's the most valuable one because it contains most of the writings has the worst writing example that you can see 
especially when you compare it with the surface of high-tech machining like the one we see. What Yusuf is saying and what we'll see in uh, this next segment is the fact that the quality of the finished surface of the box itself is far superior to the actual writing or hieroglyphics on the surface. Many archaeologists believe that the surface itself, the shaping of the box, and the fine surface are contemporary with the writings, but that makes absolutely no sense because the writing is inferior. And if they had the technology to be able to do the cutting, moving, shaping, and finishing of the box, then they would have had the capability of ele elegant and eloquent carving of the hieroglyphics, and that's not the case. So clearly what you're looking at is you're looking at a super ancient series of these boxes, and later uh, they were discovered by the dynastic Egyptians in situ, underground here, and the dynastic Egyptians carved the hieroglyphs on the surface. This is an example of recycling, of one culture creating something, and another culture coming and adding their part to it. So this is where Yusuf is going to show us the difference between the surface of the box itself and the quality of the carving. Well, it really, Brian, doesn't require a professional to realize the difference between how sharp the cuts are and the surface is and how crude the writings are. Because in, in cases like what we see over here, for example, this is a marking of a primitive tool that could not even create a straight line on the surface. Right. That's so clear. It doesn't require even a professional in machining to see the difference in these surfaces. Look at that fee here, for example. There is a point here when the tool slid over because it was not sh sharp enough even to scratch the surface uh -huh. right here. That yeah. will happen when you use a, 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 a tool that's not solid enough to conquer the surface of cyanide here. And the other mystery we see here, how this was polished. Uh -huh. You see, the first time I looked at that, I saw many bent area like this. Yet it received that extreme polishing. Right. So it didn't make sense because if you are polishing following the theory of Egyptologists that this would be polished by sand and a piece of quartz or a piece of diorite with water, then how can he fit this, this polish into the deeper parts that we see like this one here? Uh -huh. so there had to be something else. And then when we looked close, we realized the fact this was not polished the surface here was not polished, that shiny surface was not polished by sand and water. It was polished by an alchemy formula of some kind, that it was once a liquid. Uh -huh. This liquid was cased in the box, and then as any liquid, it will come down to the bottom of the lid, like what we see here, ah. and create drops coming down. Right. If, we, if you followed, here is a clear one. Yeah. This clearly was a liquid. And we see the marking of the liquid running in the bottom of the lid gives exactly the same shiny surface like here, but not deeper, where that liquid didn't go. Ah. So this is the smooth surface by the machining, and this is the polished surface by the liquid. And there is no process of sand, and water and a piece of rock to polish. This is a ridiculous theory because here we can see a clear evidence that it was an alchemy formula that they made probably acid with something else. So as you can see, this is a, a classic example of the things that we're trying to look at, not only here in Egypt, but also in places like Peru and Bolivia. You have a standard archaeological explanation for the function of something, which when an engineer and or stonemason looks at, at it, they say, there's no way. There's no way that the dynastic Egyptians with copper or bronze chisels and stone hammers could have achieved what we're looking at, and therefore, uh, the Greeks afterwards couldn't have done it. The Romans afterwards couldn't have done it. The Islamic people after that couldn't have done it. 21st century technology can't do it. We have no choice but to look farther back in time 
and look for a, a civilization that had lost ancient high technology superior to what we have today.